So let me talk a little bit about some logistical things. We'll have an opportunity at the end here to get a great photograph of all of you with Brianne and Ashton at the end. So uh, they've agreed to hang around for a few minutes. I'm not sure that they want to do 300 photographs, but they're going to do, we're going to do something pretty cool at the end. So if everybody stays in their seat at the end and we'll kind of switch it around and we'll show you what that will look like and uh, we'll have those available online. So it'll be great. A um, couple of things. Hey, did, uh, just came back from New York. The Ducks came back from New York this last week and they're heading off this weekend. What a great meet. I don't know if you got to see the distance medley. How about Raven Rogers? She did a pretty good job at the 800 meters. Hannah Cunliffe and Deja Stevens, Ariana Washington will be here today. Great performances from Sasha Wallace in the hurdles. Uh, how about the men's distance medley? They were pretty good too. A guy by the name, he's a newcomer. Uh, so I'm not sure if you've heard of him. His name is Edward Chesurek. <laughs> He was, he was pretty good. He coasted through a, a 354 mile. He looked like he was jogging. Uh, but he looked great. We've got triple jumpers. We've got long jumpers. Coach, Coach Johnson's done a marvelous job. I don't know if he's here yet, but just give him a round of applause. A couple of other updates, and I'll be pretty quick here today because we have a big, we have a big show here, and uh, we want to make sure we get to the main stuff. But a few, few announcements. Tracktown Fitness, if you haven't been there, it's on Sunday mornings at 8 a.m. Rain or shine, it's mostly been rain, uh, but it's really good. The Oregon Twilight Meet on May the 5th. Eugene Marathon. May 5th through the 7th, and um, let's, let's want to roll that commercial for the, for the marathon. Each one of our personal histories have begun with a single step. Steps that mark time. Steps that move us forward in life, toward our goals, and in our dreams. This May, dream big and make your own history at the 2017 Eugene Marathon. So see, May 5 through 7, it's the uh, Twilight Meet is Friday and then straight on through to the marathon. We've got the Pac-12s here on the 13th and 14th. This is about the, this is many times we've hosted the Pac-12 championships. This one's going to be special. Coach Johnson has asked me if you guys could account for, he needs 20 points on the men's side and 15 points on the women's side and he expects to get it from the crowd. So you guys be able to do that? We have the pre-classic here, the 25th through the 27th. We have the NCAA championships. They'll be here June 7th through the 10th. Uh, that would be pretty exciting. Coach Johnson told me he needs more points at the NCAAs than he does the Pac-12s, but the Pac-12s is a tryout for the NCAAs. 
We have coming up this summer, we have the Track Town Summer Series. It's been confirmed that the site in uh, San Francisco will be Palo Alto at Stanford University. July 2nd will be at Mount Hood Community College. And the final will be in New York City at Icon Stadium. So with that information, I want to make sure that I add, we have this year, as we did last year, Soul for Souls. It'll be here every month until marathon, to, marathon starts to collect gently used shoes for their program. Gently used, not the smelly shoes, all right? Uh, but those will be, uh, please be sure if you're, if you're interested, people are here today that will share some information with you. Now, last week, I know you thought after Sasha's comments about you know, she said that she was recruited by me and she was recruited by the Georgetown coach when I was at Stanford, and she said that she turned me down. So we did let her still back here today. I thought it was going to be one and done, but please welcome Sasha Spencer Atwood to the stage. Ben likes to tell people that I'm one of the few people who have gotten a second chance with him, and I tend to believe that. <laughs> our, <laughs> our first two guests tonight are very special ducks who have added the title of Olympians to their growing list of accomplishments. They're also two of Oregon's five athletes on the Bowerman watch list. Uh, the Bowerman is track and field, NCAA track and field's most prestigious award, so we are pleased to have with us tonight Ariana Washington and Deja Stevens. Now you guys are the first two active Oregon student athlete women to become Olympians in a program as storied as this one. How significant is that to you? Um, <laughs> I mean, it's amazing because uh, I didn't picture this, you know, everything happening until like years from now. Mm -hmm. So it's like to be at that point right now, it just gives me really high hopes for the future. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'm kind of the same way. I think that I have dreams and I have goals and I just didn't think that my dreams were as close as, you know, they were at the end of the last season. So I'm really excited. Has it changed your perspective as you guys kind of came back to school and, and looked toward the indoor and the outdoor season? Um, for me, yeah. I think that every year, you know, you make a list of goals. And um, I didn't think that a lot of the goals I made last year I was going to accomplish. And so to go back to the drawing board and like, wow, I have to make all these new goals now, um, it's kind of crazy. It's not a bad problem to have. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Did it change it for you at um, all? I'll say the same, actually, because, you know, you when I first came to Oregon, I had a set of goals. And um, they were kind of all out of order. And I was kind of like, OK, well, I didn't get this one, but I got this one. And I didn't get this one. So um, this year, I was just focused on coming in and like really getting at the goals that I set, you know, mm -hmm. and trying to like accomplish them all, like in the order I wanted to accomplish them in. <laughs> well, there are a lot of goals that you guys chased. Let's take a look at Ari and Deja this past season. Does seeing that ever get old, or do you still kind of get? <laughs> <laughs> um, no. no. <laughs> yeah, no. <laughs> you earned it. You worked hard. Yeah. <laughs> you can still appreciate it. So that was that was a lot. You guys you guys did a lot last season. Yeah. yeah. Um, you went on to place seventh at the Olympic Games in the 200 after placing second in those events at NCAs in the trials, yeah. and you swept the one and the two at NCAs, and then um, joined the Olympic team in the relay pool. <laughs> I'm sure that this being your first Olympic experience, you guys just said it was a little unexpected, yeah. but now that you've had a chance to kind of reflect on it a little bit, what, what is your favorite memory from, from the Olympic Games? There's so many. So many. Mm -hmm. like, 
it was, it started being amazing for me just leaving for Houston for training camp. Like, I was like, wow, like, I'm really here. Yeah. It started becoming a little real. Yeah, I think when we left for training camp and uh, going through team processing, I was like, oh, wait, like, this is kind of, like, (laughs) surreal now. Um, Yeah, I think from the day we left Oregon to the day we got back to Oregon, I think it was just kind of all amazing. Who did you meet? Who was the Olympian that you were most excited to take a selfie with? Um, I got a picture of Michael Phelps, and it's actually right above my bed. And um, (laughs) it's like someone was like, Michael Phelps is right next to you. I was like, oh my God, take a picture of me, please. He was like, okay. (laughs) So yeah, that was probably like my most exciting one. So yeah. Um, I'd have to say Serena Williams Mm -hmm. because I was so excited to meet her. And I actually didn't see her much um, when we were in Rio, but I saw her like when we were getting on the plane and I was one seat behind her and I was hyperventilating. I was, so excited. I was like, oh my God. And like she came and was talking to me and I was just staring at her. Like, <laughs> so yeah, I heard. That's awesome. Um, so you guys were not alone yeah. in Rio. There were lots of ducks joining you yeah. there. How was that? Was it nice to kind of look around and see familiar faces, some people, um, just to kind of comfort you and ease some of that nervousness a little bit? Definitely. Yeah, I think it's kind of cool just because, like, I think we've all just kind of been through the same thing, the same program, and just to have that connection with other people that were there was just kind of, like, super fun to have Jenna, someone who I trained with for a year, and then, like, English and Devin and even Sam. Like, I think it was just really cool to be like, you know, look where we were a couple years ago and look where we are now, so... Yeah, there's a lot of a lot of younger ducks thinking that that's yeah. possible for them yeah. since you guys have all accomplished it already. You didn't waste any time <laughs> coming back from Rio, getting ready for indoors because you guys have both run some pretty stellar times in indoors. The Armory must have been a fun weekend yeah. for you guys last weekend. Let's take a look at the Armory race. Clean start. Whoa, Hannah Cunliffe, 713. So those are PRs indoors. What does it feel like to have that NCAA qualifier behind you and having a chance to just kind of move forward towards NCs and towards uh, NCAA indoors and then, and then towards outdoor? Um, do you want to go? Okay. Um, <laughs> it feels good because I remember last year, uh, it took me all the way until I think MPSF, which is our last meet before nationals to mm-hmm. qualify. And it was like nerve wracking, like, oh my God, am I gonna make it? But um, running it in New York and um, being pretty confident in the time, it, it makes me feel good, so yeah. Yeah, same for me. I didn't qualify for indoor nationals last year, so um, to come back this year and just kind of you know getting back to the old me, I, I feel really good. That's nice. And you had an extra special little ceremony while you were uh, back in your hometown or close to your hometown of yeah. Mount Vernon. They unveiled a, a mural of you. Yeah. yeah. Um, oh. There it is. <laughs> <laughs> How does it feel to have kind of this added significance when you go back there? You're not just Deja, who was the fast girl running down the street, but now you have kind of these other accomplishments and probably more people watching you. How does it feel to go back home with the the new things on your resume? Um, You know, when I went back home, uh, I received so much love and it wasn't like, I wasn't receiving love like before because I always had like a lot of support from my hometown. So it just felt even better. And um, it's, like where this mural is, it's like a track that I used to train on. It was the first track I ever trained on. And um, it was torn down for like a long time. Like, and it wasn't being fixed. And then a new mayor came in and we connected and we got it like rebuilt. So like, it's really, I'm really happy about it. That's amazing. I got chills. (laughs) 
So uh, we've asked other people, and you had to answer the yeah. first time you were on on uh, on Track Town Tuesday. But what is it that you know made you decide to come to Oregon? We've seen a big shift, really, in the past seven years from Oregon being considered primarily a distance school to now, you know, with Coach Johnson and Curtis coming on, really becoming a sprint powerhouse and a contender for the team title every single year. How did you make your decision to come to Oregon as a young sprinter to a school that wasn't traditionally considered a sprint school? Um, well, for me, um, when I was recruited by Curtis, um, I was at a junior college, and I didn't really know much about Oregon. Um, I just you know I knew that they he didn't had tell you really, about the rain. He didn't tell yeah, you about this. Yeah, no. like, they had distance runners. You ain't right, Curtis. And I know it was cold. <laughs> and, um, a lot of people would say that. They would be like, it's so cold, like it's boring, you're gonna be sad. And I was like, ooh, like I don't wanna do that. But then um, I like had really great conversations with Curtis and he basically had like, the mindset he had about what I could do, like it was on the same route of what I wanted to do. Mm -hmm. So I basically decided to take my visit and when I took my visit, I fell in love. So mm -hmm. it was just, it was, I was going from there. <laughs> like, That's awesome. Yeah. Well, it's paid off. Yeah. And a lot of the goals that you must have set forth with Curtis at that time seem to have come to fruition. What kind of goals are you looking for as you head into the outdoor season once you get past the indoor NCAAs? Go ahead. Okay. Um, <laughs> uh, of course, like I want to defend my titles, but um, I think on a bigger scale, I think I was kind of disappointed that we didn't win outdoor nationals last year, and I felt like that was kind of our title to win. Um, so I think for more for myself, I want the team to do really well, and I just want us to go one, two, three, because um, I know that we can. And so I just want us to kind of go out there and probably score the most points that any school has ever scored, and just bring home a title indoors and out. That's amazing. <laughs> I think you guys share some of the same goals as far as that's concerned. Just dominance. He's, that's really what he's about. Yeah. <laughs> what about you, Deja? Um, I have to agree with everything Ari said because I feel the same exact way. Um, I feel like even going into indoor nationals, like the predictions show that like we're going to basically win by a good amount of points. and. Um, I just want it to carry on into outdoor, mm -hmm. you know, like I know we can win girls and guys like we just all have to do our part and we're good. Mm -hmm. Well, you know that we will be cheering for you all along the way. Everyone, please thank Ari and Deja for joining us. time I was here I had the chance to tell you guys a little bit about myself but I, I neglected to mention two very important people I talked about moving to Oregon and getting married but I didn't mention two little people in my life um, my daughter Eden was born six months before the Olympic trials when I first joined track town in 2012 and my son major came just before the teams arrived in 2014 um, for the World Junior Championship. So they have the pleasure of growing up here in Track Town under your watchful eyes, and I am very thankful of that. Speaking of pictures of my kids, though, there's one picture in particular that um, I, I hold near and dear to me. It's actually the contact photo in my phone for our next guest. If you've ever looked down at your phone and realized that your boss was calling you and that kind of anxiety wells up and you wonder what you have or, or haven't done, I keep this next picture on my phone. This has been, <laughs> this has been reading, t reading a story to my son. So whenever he calls, this is what comes up and, and this is how I think of Vin. So it helps just calm me down a little bit. <laughs> and I may or may not be here next month, so. <laughs> but I would like to welcome our next guest, the head men's coach for the 2016 Rio men's track and field team, Vin Lamana. All right, Sasha. <laughs> I know. That's two strikes. 
<laughs> so we know that you were the, the men's coach and with the stage being filled with Olympians today, we thought it was only appropriate for you to come and talk a little bit about your experience in Rio. Tell us, what does it mean to be the men's head coach? Because we know you're not out there writing workouts necessarily, so what were you doing? Well, when we first, when we got together and started to put our staff together, we decided that we were going to be a, a coaching staff that was going to be completely cohesive and we were going to provide the athletes with everything they could possibly want or need in order to maximize performances. And that's really what we did. And what that really means is this. We, we really engaged the personal coaches. It's the first time that the actual personal coaches were really involved in every aspect aspect of everything they did, whether it was the warm-up track or whether it was what happened in the warm-up, whether they needed whatever they needed, we gave it to them. Um, typical day. Let me talk a little bit about the typical day. The, the, the traffic, how many people have been to Rio? Okay, well, is there traffic in Rio? <laughs> Well, there's a lot of traffic in Rio, and there was especially a lot of traffic for the Olympic Games. And what we did is we provided, uh, what happened was it would take about 40 minutes to get from the village, and the village was, was actually really pretty nice. They were all brand new high rises. Um, you know, if you, the only problem that they did have, and I'm sorry that, um, that Ari and Deja came, but when you used the bathroom, you weren't, able, you weren't allowed to flush it. You couldn't flush the toilets. So the athletes found that pretty, uh, pretty tough. But that's what happened. You couldn't put any paper down the toilet. So that was one thing. So we didn't do that. We didn't take care of that. But what we did is we had to be sure we were, they were in a position that they had everything they needed because if they did flush the paper down the toilet, we had to call the USOC to come and clean it up. <laughs> that was the other thing we did. And then, is Hassan Mead in the room? Where's Hassan Mead? Hassan was here, but Hassan Mead ran this great race in the 5,000, but he fell. Now, this was the longest protest period that could ever be. So if any of you watched the Olympic Games on TV and you saw how many times the U.S. was brought back in, the four by one for women, having to come back and run by themselves to qualify and then run the finals out of lane one, that was my job to go in there and fight with the officials. So that's what we did. We got Hassan Mead reinstated. So that was what I did as head coach. Well, you did something right, because the US brought home 32 medals. There were remarkable performances within there. There's moments that we remember, um, Abby D'Agostino and, and her special moment, Matt Centrowitz winning gold, Matthew Centrowitz winning gold. Yep, you can clap for Matthew. You mentioned the four by one, and there was Clayton Murphy and Ryan Krauser. What are the things as a coach that have stood out in your mind about the performances in Rio. In Rio? Well, you know, you're gonna hit you're gonna see two of them here in a little while in Ashton and Brianne. Uh, Abby Abby Diagostino, I don't know if you saw that, but she had do you remember when in the uh, in the five thousand meters when there was this fall and they got tangled up and tripped up and Abby stopped, Abby actually came and they helped each other up and she won the award for the outstanding sportsman. It was a phenomenal moment. You know, it wasn't about athletic performances, it was about the true spirit of the Olympic Games. Matthew, of course, was fantastic and winning. The, how many guys thought that was? A, we, how many people thought Matthew Centers was going to win the fifteen hundred at the World Cup? <laughs> There's a few. There's a few. I would say at 200 meters to go, I didn't think he was going to win. Uh, but he did, and he was unbelievable. And probably the best moment, I was sitting in the stands uh, watching, uh, actually it was the triple jump. And Christian Taylor, uh, Will Clay, and I was sitting in the stands. The event finished, and all of a sudden, I see Will Clay jump over the stand, over the top from from the runway, through the uh, through the stands in Rio, and I'm sitting at that time next to Queen Harrison, and he proposes to her, <laughs> like one foot away from me. <laughs> And at this time, none of, nobody was letting him out of the stands. Oh, so gosh. 
he's the the gap between where he had to get back on the stands to be to get back into the stadium for drug testing was a long way. Good thing so he's I, a jumper. Well, <laughs> if he had jumped that, we wouldn't have seen him anymore. And he, I said, "Well, you're going to have to get you're going to have to get back out there so you can be drug tested." He said, "Don't worry, coach. I'm a jumper." I said, <laughs> "Please, no." So it was, was kind of cool. Well, and of course, as we've just seen, the Ducks made a big splash in Rio. How does it feel um, being someone who comes from the collegiate environment and seeing a lot of those kids whom you had a part in recruiting really be successful at, at the Olympic level? I'm sure you say those kind of things when you sit in their living rooms, but to actually be in Rio with some of those kids, how did that feel? Well, Sasha, you remember when I sat in your living room? <laughs> I do. <laughs> <laughs> and she, I was at Stanford at the time, and she said, there, there are no sprinters at Stanford, no 400-meter runners, no 800-meter runners, but Stanford did win the NCAAs in 2000, <laughs> just as a reminder. Thanks. <laughs> but the University of Oregon, we, we first put together a plan for what we were going to do at the University of Oregon. It's funny, you mentioned it before. And we talked about having the most dominant track and field program ever assembled in the history of the NCAA. I think we're getting there. What do you think? I would say so. And, I, and, and the, numbers, the numbers from Rio really support it. I have to read this to get it right. But Dave Taylor, your friend and mine, uh, came up with, uh, compiled all the, the medal counts, and the University of Oregon, had it been its own country, would have tied with China for fourth in the overall medal count. She just, she just made that up. <laughs> And they would have they've been fourth in gold medal, the overall gold medal count, the University of Oregon would have placed fourth amongst the entire world. So I'd say, I'd say you're doing something right. Yeah. Well, I think that there, if you take a look at that, that sh screenshot, you take a look at the athletes, not just the University of Oregon, but those athletes that have Oregon ties. It's pretty impressive. Think about what this state and what you guys have done in supporting all these athletes. Think about those cold days. Think about the rainy days. Think of all the, these athletes that you've helped achieve that. And uh, it's pretty impressive. And I think that in 2021, every person in this room has the opportunity to have not only the University of Oregon be dominant, but to have the United States be dominant. Who knows how many medals we could win at the World Championships if we could put them on and have a home field advantage. There's no home field advantage for the University of Oregon at the NCAAs, I might add, though. <laughs> uh, but for the World Championships, there'll be a lot of home field advantage. Thank you, Vin. One thing we're going to have you do before you leave the stage is to draw a couple of names. All right, I see my grandson is sitting. He wants to say hello to my grandson there. Do, Brian, can you wave? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so if, he, if I pick his name, we have to throw it back in. <laughs> Want me to read it or you? You read it. So these winners will get autographed progression boards that you saw out there by Ashton and Brianne and um, uh, one month membership to the DAC. Wow. So which one is this? Both. Each gets both. Wow. Jay Milliken. There you go. See us at the end and we'll take care of it. Dig deep. Yeah. Dig deep. What does this one get? Same thing. Same thing. Let's see. Ashton Eaton. No. <laughs> Sorry, Ash. Um, Brianne. No. All right. It's Bill Maloney. Where is that? Where is Bill? There he is. All right. So see us at the end. Thank you, Vin. All right, for guys. See you later. I feel like there should be some theme music that plays right now or something as we prepare for our next guest. 
They've really become a cornerstone of the track and field community here in Oregon for the last 10 years. We've watched them compete as young athletes at the preview and the twilight. We've seen them train through all kinds of crazy weather with all kinds of crazy implements. But one thing has remained consistent and constant throughout the time we've had a chance to spend with them, their relentless pursuit of excellence. Now, track and field's power couple shocked a lot of people when they announced their retirement earlier this year, but we are pleased that we have an opportunity to spend a couple moments recognizing their accomplishments and thanking them for the contributions that they've made to our community. Please join me in welcoming Brianne and Ashton. There are no longer two Eatons. There are three Eatons now. <laughs> when I put that on social media, people were like, oh, you're having a baby tomorrow. And I was like, yeah, yeah that's right. happening. I, I she wear looks it great. well. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, don't, don't I look great? You look phenomenal. Uh, it's that heptathlon workout plan, the pre-pregnancy. <laughs> Do it every time. Yeah. Now, this is Zora. Um, How did you guys choose the name Zora? Um, I like Z and X names for some weird reason. And uh, we actually went to South America on, on the Machu Picchu Trail. And our guide's name was Darwin. And I said, are you named after Charles Darwin? And he's like, yeah. And I thought, hmm, that's kind of a cool idea, naming uh, our, our pets after like notable people. So I started looking up Z names of notable people. And I came across Zora Neale Hurston, who wrote Their Eyes Are Watching God. And it just so happened she also lived in Eatonville, Florida. It was meant to be. Yeah, I think so. It really was. So all of your shoes are intact still, Brie? And <laughs> she is the best little puppy. Yeah. She's so calm. Um, her biggest flaw, though, that I noticed two days ago is we have a, a full-length mirror in our bedroom. Mm -hmm. And she's really vain because she's <laughs> constantly looking at herself in the mirror every time she comes in the bedroom. So which one of you did she get that from? That might be hereditary. <laughs> <laughs> Good question. But she's a she's a Bernadoodle, which is Bernie's Mountain Dog Poodle mix. Very cool. Well, you guys gave us so much to cheer about in 2016. So throughout your entire career, but we we have to begin somewhere. We can begin with the most recent season. Bree, you overcame uh, the biggest deficit in history to come back and win the gold medal at the World Indoor Championships in Portland. You guys didn't have to travel far. I have to say something about that because the morning of the competition, we warmed up on the street in Pioneer Square, and it was because, um, you know, Canada and U.S. We had we had different hotels, so we kind of met out just north by the the Starbucks there. So every time we drive by that, I get like a little good memory from oh, warming up in that spot. That's sweet. And Ash, you uh, won your third indoor world gold medal. Yes. So that was a nice way to, to start the year. And then you guys kind of had to, to do what athletes do and turn your sights to the next thing. And it being uh, 2016, that was obviously the Olympic Games. You kind of put your head down and, and start preparing for that. Ash, um, the, the system in the US is a little different than the one in Canada. So you had to go through the full rigor. And Brie got to use the meat for a little more of a tune-up. But once you guys were, were there, it was game on. And Brie, it was, it was your turn to, to go first. And you found yourself on day, you know, coming out of day one in a position that, that you don't typically find. You were coming out of the first day of competition in sixth place. Where, where was your head at that point? And, and what did you do to make sure you could come back into day two and give the performance that ultimately you, you gave? I don't think that there was anything on the first day that I regret or that I felt like I did wrong. It just was an off day. Um, and I was just kind of, I was looking forward, that night I was just looking forward to day two. Like, let's just 
get going. I want to uh, like start a, a new competition and just kind of redeem myself. And then when I got to the warm up track. Uh, the morning of the second day, I was kind of starting to get nervous again and doubting a little bit. And my sports psychologist came over and she was like, snap out of it. You know, it's a new day. And I, you know, it's always hard when you start like in a, in a hole because now I had to dig myself out and it, I was just feeling like overwhelmed about it. And I remember her saying, if you don't turn this around or snap out of this kind of like crappy mood, you're going to regret it. Mm. And as soon as she said that, I was like, oh, she's right. You know, and it was at that point, I was like, I, I need to turn, you know, mm. totally switch my mentality. And yeah, I, I think I just relaxed more. And then long jump went well and javelin. And yeah, then it was, I mean, after that javelin was over, I was like, oh, <laughs> sigh of relief. But um, yeah. Was there an event um, after which you said, I am... I'm going to contend for the, for a medal, and I'm going to I'm going to put myself on the podium. Is there you know a place where you reach where you knew based on the points, based on how you were feeling, and the events that you had ahead of you that 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 was going to be your goal? I think before the long jump, mm -hmm. I had after I had that talk with my sports psychologist, I said to myself, I'm going to get a medal um, because my second day is great. I don't really have a weak event on the second day, um, and I knew that some of the girls that were ahead of me did. So I think maybe that just gave me like a little bit of um, positivity and that kind of slump of a situation. I always said that if that heptathlon was three days, it would have been no question. <laughs> yeah. Because I think what happened was in 2012, Brian went into Harry's office after that Olympics, after that Olympics and said, I am going to go for getting a medal. And she had gotten 10th or 11th at the games in 2012. So to say, Medal or failure for four years, mm -hmm. and then be there on that day. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, that's a lot of stress to to put on yourself for, for that long of a time. So, um, how are you preparing yourself for for the possible outcomes, Ash? I know that that it must be hard not to be really emotionally invested in mm -hmm. not just the her performances, but in in her and how she's feeling as your wife. Yeah. I always heard people say, you know what, if they just give it their best, you'll feel good about it. And I was like, that is such crap. <laughs> <laughs> but I truly believed after watching Brian for four years go through that, mm -hmm. I knew that if she came away, because there's nothing more you can do, like yeah. there's literally nothing more that you can do except whatever it is that you can do to the maximum of that time. Mm -hmm. And so I thought, I don't care what the result is. If she comes out of this giving it her all, I'm going to be happy. And if she's smiling at the end, then I know that she did that. Well, you guys definitely had lots to smile about by the time it was all over. But did you know at that point that this was going to be your last Olympic experience? And, and now that you do know that, are there things about it, like warming up in Pioneer <laughs> Courthouse Square, that have taken on a new significance to you, knowing that that, that was the last time that, that those things will happen for you guys? I think we, bo we both knew it was our last Olympics, for sure. There was no, no chance we were doing another Olympics. Um, it's just like the four years is so hard, and mm -hmm. the way we do it is we just pretty much put everything else aside, and that becomes our life, and we just didn't feel like we could do that anymore. Uh, I think we, we, I, I never thought that that was going to be my last pre-meet warm-up or anything like that. Ash might have a different answer, but I kind of always thought that I would do another year. Mm -hmm. um, but at that point, I hadn't really thought about it too much. I was just so focused on the Olympics, and I said I would think about how I was feeling after. Like Bree, I knew it was the last games, and even though I thought I was going to do another year, deep down I knew I probably wouldn't. Mm -hmm. And the things that I took away were mostly in and around the village aspect. Mm -hmm. I thought I would wake up early in the morning and just kind of walk around the village mm -hmm. and understand that this would be the last time I'd be in this place as an athlete. Mm -hmm. And knowing that for two weeks, the world comes together peacefully and I'm right in the epicenter. Mm -hmm. And I thought, that is really cool. And to be there with Brianne, too. You know, we'd have breakfast every morning and, oh. But just to know that, 
Um, it, it would honestly be like every country in this room, every country represented in this room. Imagine being in this room with mm -hmm. at least one person from every country. You have good, bad, or indifferent as far as world, the world goes. I just thought, you know, that was cool. Yeah. It was really cool. And one of the cool things that we as fans at home experienced while you guys were in Rio was getting to watch you on television commercials. <laughs> um, let's take a look at one of those commercials now. First. 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 That's not a good thing. Hey, Bree. Since we're traveling separately to Rio, I'm going to buy us two tablets first. so we can video check. Choose Visa Checkout, the easier way to pay online first. You hang up. No, you hang up. Should have seen, seen that coming. coming. My only regret is I. I oh, yeah. <laughs> I wish we would have gotten to meet Morgan Freeman. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you can still arrange that. I know, I'm for maybe, sure. maybe. So did you guys have input? Did they ask you? We know that you're competitive and competitive with each other. Did they ask you what, what sorts of things you guys compete at and how reflective of that is like every day in the Ashton and Brianne Eaton house? <laughs> So this, uh, I guess, putting together this commercial was different than all the other ones because we were training in Santa Barbara and our manager, Paul, called and said, would you guys be willing to go down to LA for one day at the end of the training camp? Uh, Visa kind of put together this idea for a commercial. It was like a week before it that they kind of threw this together. They were like, you know, it's a, it's a competition thing, so they're looking for input, and you know, when you get there on the day, they can just t let them know. I'm thinking, okay, normally like these scripts are really planned out, and it wasn't. It was just like, what do you guys think? So the toothbrush one, the shoe tying one was just, like they went out and bought toothbrushes that day. <laughs> like we, when so we that, got that there. was our input, because that was your idea. we had done that before. <laughs> <laughs> At home. <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> well, in the spirit of competition, we thought we would give you guys a couple questions and see who's on their A game today. Now, you guys have responded to these questions in advance. Um, and uh, we'll just see where you guys are. We don't want you to lose the edge that, that we know you've gained as athletes. So, first question. What is Ashton's idea of a perfect date spot? I think really did you answer that? Yeah, I did. <laughs> Let's see it. <laughs> the movies. <laughs> the movies. <laughs> the top of a mountain. Well, we only ever do track, and every time we go on a date, you're like, let's just go to the movie. The 7 o'clock movie. That's what you always say. Is that his go-to? How, how accurate is that, Brianne? The top of a mountain? Yeah, that's accurate. Yeah, that's good. It's okay. Well, so what's Brianne's favorite date spot? <laughs> <laughs> Just do it. It's already on the card. The beach. <laughs> Morning hike and breakfast. At least Perhaps at so the beach. So we have a date every day. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I guess minus the. Yeah. Nice. Um, yeah, what I have is, no idea what she wrote. So. What is Ashton's greatest phobia? Wait, is my favorite phobia? Oh, yeah. <laughs> How would I ever know that? I don't Spiders. Know. Spiders. <laughs> <laughs> Dying before he's 100. We would really expect nothing less of you, Ashton. <laughs> and what is Brienne most afraid of? What I say? <laughs> <laughs> Not being able to breathe while falling. <laughs> That's it's, pretty specific. It's so, it's so she was like, I was like, let's go skydiving. She's like, no, I'll, I'll suffocate. Like, There's does any air flying in your face. Does anyone else get that on a roller coaster, though, when it drops and you can't breathe? Yeah, that's my fear. So what is it? Spiders. spiders. <laughs> no one kills spiders in our house. <laughs> so if oh. one had to be on a reality show, what reality show would Ashton be on? Yeah. Yeah! 
I actually have no idea what's going to happen after this because all my notes just fell on the ground. <laughs> um, and what about Brienne? What would you be on? Obviously. <laughs> Meet them, not be on the show. Not true. <laughs> uh, that's true. This this should be a pretty easy one. Who is the better cook? Oh. Brienne. <laughs> Winner. Finish this sentence. We are complete opposites when it comes to. <laughs> <laughs> this is this is okay. <laughs> Planning, organization, I think those are in the same family. I think those are along the same lines. Planning is better. Yes. A surefire way to get on Ashton's nerves is to... What did you say? <laughs> That's pretty close. Oh, sorry, read about that. Ask him questions in the morning. Ask, ask me a question in the morning. That's the surefire way to get on my nerves. And Bree said... So I always do this thing wh when I want him to do something, I go, hey, Ash. And he's always like, oh, because he knows it means I'm asking him to do something. Yeah, does any other husband get that feeling? Like, hey, Ash. I didn't leave the milk out, did I? Well, I'd say that you guys are pretty on the ball. Um, what's the last one? Oh, that's oh yeah. So what's the, what's the surefire way to get on Brienne's nerves? Surefire way to get on Brienne's nerves. Oh, you have two. On each other's nerves. Yeah. Right? To get on Breeze. To get on Breeze. So I oh. was supposed to pick two, or I have two to pick from. I was supposed to pick one, <laughs> but it's both. <laughs> To take the longest route, the slowest route, yeah. and to drive scared. Yeah. So, to get on Brianne's nerves, if you're gonna go somewhere and you're driving, just drive slow, <laughs> look around. <laughs> you know, when it's when it's like a stale green, come up to it nice and slow till it turns yellow. Ah, gotta stop. <laughs> she, she is so A to B as quick as you can get there. <laughs> That it's <laughs> yeah, that's a good I'm way to make a boil. I'm that way too. Like I, I want the closest parking spot. Let's let's just do it. So Ash has this thing where he can't focus on two things at one time. <laughs> I can focus and on ten. If he's talking in the car, he has no idea how to get home. So <laughs> I have to I have to tell him get in the left lane, get in the left. We have to turn, and then he gets mad because I'm not listening to him. But <laughs> we have places to be, so. Anyways, and was I supposed to answer? Brienne's was what? For what is the quickest way, the surefire way to get on Ashton's trip? Okay, so first I of all, was I right? Wrong. I answered. Was I right? Yeah, you're right. No. I answered. I didn't. My answer doesn't make sense. Sure does. That's okay. No. What? This is what annoys me about Ashton. Well, that's that's interesting, also. <laughs> You lose stuff easily? Oh, all the time. Oh, gosh. <laughs> yeah. What is uh, the most like important thing that he has lost for no good reason? <laughs> um, well, he's lost his wallet numerous times. Oh, Not to pain, because... Yeah. Yeah. I once left my entire bag of shoes and a brand new digital camera in the upper bin of a of an aircraft. Oh no. Yeah. <laughs> Two weeks ago he left his suit in an airplane. Oh god. That's right. That's actually that's that was accurate. <laughs> so not... he is not allowed to walk Zora by himself. <laughs> Actually, you know, the funny thing is, the first two days that I, we had her and I left him at home with her for like an hour, I was getting texts like, the dog is doing this, what, what am I supposed to do? I'm like, I don't, Ash, I've never had a dog either and it's a dog, I don't know, just do something. So I don't, we're glad that we had a chance to get to know you guys a little better. Yes. Boom. That's a, I, I adopted that strategy years ago. <laughs>
So um, we're not the only ones who have enjoyed getting to know you. All of the people here in Oregon that we have uh, that have had a chance to enjoy you guys both on and off the field have appreciated too. Let's look back at a video of your time in Oregon. but for them. That's the multi, you know? You can't put everything together perfectly. And if you do, then it's like a world record. You One really special person from your time here in Oregon um, who had some memories that he'd like to share, but he decided that he thought you should share the memories instead. Let's hear what he has to say. Oh. Wow, <laughs> Harry Mara, coach of Ashton Eaton and Brianne Tyson Eaton. My favorite memory of each of them for Brianne, that's an easy one, it was on the warm up track, London, England, 2012 Olympic Games. Brian was warming up for the javelin throw prior to the competition. She'll tell you the story. She does it and she tells it better than anybody else. Favorite memory for Ashton? One word, sniper. <laughs> so I pulled March 2014 in a car in a limo on the way to the airport after the World Indoor Championships. Uh, Ashton will tell you that story. He tells it better than anybody else. I'm excited about these stories. Oh. Let's hear it, guys. Sniper, what did, what did that mean, Ash? Yeah, I'll go first. So it was Sopot Poland, Sopot Poland, and Harry and I, it was early morning. It was after, uh, you know, the indoor HEP, and we're driving to the airport, like he said, and him and I are both kind of exhausted. I'm looking out one side of the window. Or, or one side of the car out of the window. He's looking out the other side, and it's been quiet for like 20 minutes. During that like 20 or 30 minutes, I'm looking at the terrain. <laughs> I'm looking at the terrain, and it, it almost reminds me of like a Midwest feel. There's leafy trees, but it's like winter, so there's leaves all over the ground, rolling hills, and I'm thinking, you know, this is Poland. I can just imagine, you know, back in the day when they were getting invaded by Germany, snipers like hanging out in these leaves and stuff. And like just envisioning a sniper crawling around in the bushes. I don't know why, but that's what I was thinking. Uh -huh. <laughs> and Harry <laughs> is looking out of the other side of the window and he goes. <laughs> and remember, they're not talking. So they're talk. just both in their he, own. He's talk. looking out the other side of the window and he goes, you know what? That's what I always wanted to be when I grew up. And I turn around and go, a sniper? <laughs> And it's, it was, it's, I wish Harry was here because it's so much, but he, he looks at me and he goes, sniper? <laughs> Where did you get that? <laughs> oh. Harry, it's it, a good one. Yeah, and it was just the fact that I was talking to myself in my head. <laughs> he, and what he was trying to say, he wanted to be like an environmentalist. Oh, okay. I mean, that, that's, what he was, yeah, that's what he was trying to get at. He was like, you know, this forest looks so great. I, I always <laughs> wanted to do that. <laughs> oh, that was, we, we laughed, and it was probably another 30 minutes to the air, and we just laughed the whole time. <laughs> Tell us about London 2012, okay. Brie. So I have to, a little disclaimer here. There, I have, there's a small little cuss word in this story that I, I know, but I have to do it in order to make this story. 
It's just a little one. Okay. Is that okay? Yeah. Um, yes. Earmuffs. <laughs> um, we were about, I don't know, it must have been like two weeks before London, I got hurt throwing the javelin. So my back was a little bit sore. So we hadn't thrown for two weeks. So the javelin's coming up in the competition and Harry and I are on edge because I haven't thrown in so long. And he's like, let's go to the far end of the warm-up track, the throwing area, and um, where no one can kind of see us because I think he was just stressed about it. Well, the other heptathletes were kind of off to the other side. And I start doing my warm-ups, and Harry's starting to get more excited. He's like, you know, that looks really good. Just keep it under control. And I'm going up and down the field, and it's the best it's ever felt. Harry's like, breathe you're on, you're on, you're good. And Harry, I don't know if anyone knows him, but he gets really fired up about things. And he, I continue to throw, and I'm kind of starting to get warmed up, and I'm relaxed, but he's like fired up. And I'm throwing them, he goes, Tyson, you're on, you're on. And he starts like pacing around, and the other coaches are starting to look. I'm like, okay, like calm down. He's like, no, 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 you don't understand. I throw another one, he's like, Tyson, Holy crap! And he's walking around, and I throw the last one. He goes, shit me on Sunday, Tyson. We're out of here! And he's like running down the side of the track. All the coaches are looking, and yeah, that was, that was. He knew it. Yeah. He knew it had all come together. Yeah. That's amazing. <laughs> Harry wasn't the only one who wanted to share some memories with you. We actually um, opened, uh, opened up an opportunity to people from all over the world to wow. uh, take a chance to say thank you and share something with you guys that they remember. And we're compiling those in a memory book that we are going to give wow. to you. Because um, we want you to know that, you know, in addition to all of the times that we've had the opportunity to sit in the stands and watch you, there's a story um, that's in it for us as well. So we want to bring this up and give it to you guys. We can get our crew together here. It's kind of a... <laughs> that's okay. Sissy will do it. <laughs> now you might recognize... Um, Thank you very she much. Showed us her yes. <laughs> Give them to Brienne. Oh, thank you. <laughs> so I, uh, I have, I have a quick Ashton story. So there, uh -oh. and I, I didn't, I didn't put the picture in the slideshow, but you took a picture with Eden, the little girl in the polka dots, when she was um, in 2012, mm -hmm. when she has, she was just born. And then this year, we were, uh, I was, you know, running around the stadium like a crazy person, like we are during the trials, and uh, it was the last event, and we did the award on the stage. Um, in the festival as opposed to in the stadium. So when, apparently when Eden realized that you were not doing a full victory lap, she started to become unraveled. <laughs> and by the time uh, we got to the festival field, I got this call from my mother-in-law and said that your daughter is in like full convulsions because she didn't get to high five Ashton on the victory lap and she's really, she's really out of sorts and so um, Eden came back, I, I did what moms with full access passes do, <laughs> and, uh, and we went back into the, the press room and you took a picture that she will never forget, and it just kind of, for me as a parent, um, the opportunity for our kids to be able to look to you guys and to see outstanding athletes and people with an outstanding character is a learning experience that can't be met. Thank you. So in addition to the people who contributed to the book, there were a couple of other people who had some pretty nice things to say about you guys. Let's take a look at that. There's the screen right there. Hi, everybody. This is Hypermeeting Gutsy Speaking, and I am one of 400 crazy volunteers who organizes a well-known combined events meeting in Austria every year. My name is Walter Weber, and I am the sports director of this meeting. 
My name is Todd Johnston. I coached Brianne when she was in high school with the Saskatoon Track and Field Club. I uh, went to school at the University of Oregon with both Ashton and Brianne and was a part of the Nike family with them uh, as a professional track and field athlete. I am Lance Steele, four-time Olympian, Olympic silver medalist in the Hammer. I was Ashton and Brianne's substitute shot and discus coach for two days each, but predominantly I was their massage therapist while they were here at the University of Oregon. Hello, I'm Paul Doyle, uh, Ashton and Brianne's manager. My name is Paul Swangard, and for the last 20 plus years, I've been the voice of Hayward Field. I'm Mark Morical of the Bulletin newspaper in Bend, Oregon. Hi, my name is Claire Michelle. I am a former duck distance runner and steeplechaser friend and college roommate of Ashton and Brianne. Melissa Gurgle. I am a former teammate, former roommate, close friend, and eternal third wheel to Brianne and Ashton. Ken Go, the Oregonian. I've known uh, Bree and Ashton since they were both youngsters. I'm 2016 U.S. Olympian and former duck football and track athlete Devin Allen. Um, I met Brianne and Ashton when I got here at the University of Oregon about four years ago. My name is Dan Steele, and I actually recruited Ashton to Oregon. I'm Andrew Weeding. Brian and Ashton often referred to me as the coolest, most amazing human being they've ever experienced on planet Earth. And Mars. But I'm more commonly known to have been a teammate of theirs in college. My name is Marshall Ackley. Uh, I was uh, training partners with Ashton from 2006 to 2011. Harry Mara, coach of Ashton Eden and Brian Tyson Eden. Curious. Is joyous? Curious. The atypical. And by, I mean this in the most positive way possible. Thoughtful. He's a good boy. He's daring. Casually curious, I guess that's two words. <laughs> but it's what he is. Competitive. I would say tenacious. Determined. Would be driven. Be meticulous. Tenacity. Wonderful. She's a dream for Ashton as, as his wife. And she was a dream for an organizer as an athlete. There's one word to describe Brianne. I don't know what it is but there's a picture that does a pretty good job. In Rio, after the 800, she's standing there. Everybody's lying down on the track and she's standing there. The expression on her face says it all. I don't know that I've ever been so proud of a former athlete as I, as I was of her in that moment. And that picture captured everything you want to know about her. One word simply to describe Ashton and Brianne, honesty, honest people. Word to describe Ashton Brianne, it would just be excellence. Very genuine people. You, know, you go out on top as a role model. The one word that I would describe both of them is class. Very unselfish, interested in other people and not all about themselves. One word I would use to describe Brianne and Ashton would probably be flucky nokini highly piley facacious. It's the essence of determining something is valueless. And how do you put a value on performances from Ashton and Brianne, or a friendship for that matter? Brian and, and Ashton, both the best memories I've had of them is how gutsy their performances have been. Perhaps the best memory was the, was the 1500 meters in, uh, in 2012 at the Olympic trials. About 20 minutes before the race, running out of the press box at uh, Hayward Field and running down the back steps and bumping into Harry Mara, who was running up the back steps to meet me. And we looked at each other. We didn't even have to talk to one another or say anything. We just sat down on the steps and each of us had a piece of paper in our hand. And it was the splits Ashton had to run to break the world record. And we opened the papers and looked at them. His numbers and my numbers matched. We didn't even have to say anything. Harry ran down to tell uh, Ash and I ran back into the press box to tell 22,000 people what he was going to run. And then he went and did it. My favorite memory of Ashton, although many on the track, has to be the time that Russell Brown and I filmed a Cribs episode at his house. At one point, all three of us were dressed in ridiculous outfits, play fighting in the middle of the street. I'm surprised the police weren't called, actually. <laughs> uh, about 72 hours, I think, before you set the world record for the first time here at Hayward. I was having a bad day and you came up and you said, hey, coach, don't lose your zen. So I'm going to throw that back at you and I hope you never need it as much as I needed it that day. But hey, Ashton, don't lose your zen. I feel like I really got to see their Brianna and Ashton's relationship unfold. Um, so they actually had their first date on Valentine's Day, and I remember when they came back, 
Ashton brought me a chocolate rose and a card and I remember thinking to myself, wow, this guy must be super serious about this if he's trying to impress the roommate. In 15, we had to arrange some ice packages for her bathroom at the hotel where they were sharing a room. And Hubert from the Sonne asked, are they so hot that they need so much ice to calm down? I never need this with my wife. Other people knew it, but they were trying to keep it on the down low. And uh, I was sitting next to Ashton uh, on the plane. I said, what's going on with Brienne? And he said, well, it's complicated. I said, well, I doubt it. Are, are you, is she your girlfriend? And he said, uh, no, she's not my girlfriend. Uh, we're, we're just dating. I said, I don't know what that means. Are, are you allowed to date other girls? Would she get mad? And he goes, yeah, she'd get mad. Can she date other boys or would you get mad? No, I'd get mad. I said, well, Ashton, that's the dictionary definition of a girlfriend. And he laughed and he said, okay, I, I guess she's my girlfriend. But then later on that night, we were going over the rules uh, for travel, something we do at every meet. And we got to the part about staying in the hotel, not going in boys' rooms, uh, and boys not going in girls' rooms. And, and I said um, in front of everybody, well, now that Ashton and Brienne are officially boyfriend and girlfriend, and uh, Brienne's mouth went open, she was like, <gasps> and she looked immediately at Ashton. <laughs> And Ashton just looked and he put his head down. <laughs> he was in so much trouble. It was hilarious. Probably not for Ashton. Thank you, Ashton and Brienne, for being my teammates, for being a friend, for being awesome. This sport is infinitely better with having had you guys in it. For, for just being tremendous people. It wasn't even so much what you accomplished, but, but how you did it and, and who you are. And you guys, are, you're the real deal, both of you. For being such great role models um, and showing what it really means to be compassionate and kind to everyone you encounter. Uh, you, know, you made the sport enjoyable and you raised the level of sport and you left it better than it was. And that was terrific. So thank you. And the only thing that I can say is I can't wait to see what both of you do next. Um, I think the world is in for a real treat because I think that anything the two of you put your mind to is going to be pretty excellent. You know, for the University of Oregon, for Nike, and, and most of all for the sport of track and field, um, you guys are just tremendous people, first and foremost, um, and also tremendous athletes. You know, you guys are going to provide inspiration for, for kids for years to come, you know, for all that you've accomplished uh, in both the heptathlon and, and the decathlon. And Thank you, Brian and Ashton, for being incredible friends to me. Uh, I feel really lucky to have you guys in my life, and I wish you nothing but success and happiness in the future. Thank you for staying real and authentic in the process. I think what impresses me the most is that you will leave the sport with the same character with which you came in. I hope to see you both sometime soon. All the best probably gave more to the sport than the sport really gave to you and we all appreciate that and certainly hope that you'll be a, a symbol of what we aspire all of our athletes to be moving forward. It's been such a great time having you here and I'm going to miss you both. Take care. I want to thank Brianne and, and Ashton for being a great inspiration to all the young athletes out there in uh, Canada and the U.S. Thank you both for having inspired the most wonderful event of athletics. You know, Ashton and Bree, thank you for making me want to be a better person. For simply being the people that you are. Congratulations on a great career, and I don't have to wish you luck forward because I know you'll kick ass. guys for not only being here but for cheering us on for the last 10 years at Hayward Field for buying season tickets and some of you coming to the world championships and Olympics and hearing the quacks in the stands when we're getting ready to run the 8 and the 15. Um, yeah and for just following everything and wishing us the best we appreciate it. I remember 10 years ago coming to my first uh, I think it was an Oregon Club meeting, 
and I remember Coach Steele or Coach Alana was like, hey, would you, would you go to this meeting and, and talk to some of our uh, boosters and, and track fans? And I thought, you know, I'm a freshman, I'm thinking, well, yeah, I guess so, what am I supposed to say and do? They're like, nothing, they just want to meet you. And little did I know what kind of community I was getting into. And so, for, from both of us, thank you for being, uh, I think, I think our performances are a reflection of the, the support that we've had behind us all these years. So that's in large part thanks to you guys. So we are going to take this opportunity to take a picture with Ashton and Bree. If we could have everyone in this section come over and fill in this one, we're all going to stand and we're going to turn toward the camera. That'll be right here. Oh, wow. And we will um, distribute this online to everyone who's here. Biggest selfie ever. <laughs> If anyone would like to contribute to the digital version of the memory book that we're producing, you can do that at info at gotracktownusa.com. Yeah, so. Oh. 